Wonderful, thank you. Um, our, our New Testament reading today, we're, we're going to flip them. Uh, our New Testament reading today is John 12, 44 through 50. It's in your pew Bible on pages uh, 993. I'll give you a second. Then Jesus cried out, Those who believe in me do not believe in me only, but the one who sent me. When they look at me, they see the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for those who hear my words but do not keep them, I do not judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for those who reject me and do not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Amen. Thank you, Brett, very much. And um, I'd like to thank Tara for that beautiful music. Really appreciated that so much and so appropriate for today. I know we've already prayed, but I would like you to bow your heads and join me just for a brief prayer, asking and inviting the Holy Spirit to be here this morning. So, dear Lord, I know that you have written amazing things in your holy word. And today I ask for your Holy Spirit to fall upon myself and each one here in a way that will give us a, us a new look and a depth of understanding in what you're trying to talk to us and say to us about such an important subject. You've promised the Holy Spirit. We've asked and now we look forward to it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. This has been a tough couple weeks, or a month even, for me. I imagine some of you know some of the reasons why. Um, it's been a little bit since I lost my best friend, Jerry Chudley. And um, I wasn't uh, the only best friend that Jerry had. Um, a lot of you felt very close to Jerry and um, appreciate so much what he did. But I find myself during the week every once in a while saying, I can't wait to get on the phone and tell him about this or that, you know. And I've got to wait a little while before I can do that. But this last week we had a, a, a really frightening experience from the, the standpoint of the conference office. Um, I bid... Uh, Larry and Linda goodbye right at the trailer with the tow dolly and watched them drive off to the Ohio sun sunset and uh, thinking everything was going to be great. They did make it there fine. I was thinking something could happen to the trailer or something could happen along the way. But the trip was good. Larry told me that he felt great all the way. But when he got there, he felt tremendously fatigued and started getting more and more fatigued and then he started getting jaundiced. Didn't know where that was coming, so Linda said, we've got to go to the hospital. So they went, and uh, he went downhill really fast. It turned out that he had an infection in the, um, I forgot the name, the gland that starts with P, that no one, pituitary, no, the other one, pancreas. And... Uh, and it, um, it looked bad, and he wasn't uh, passing any bile or anything, so he was getting quite jaundiced. So they rushed him to surgery, put in a stint, and it seemed to be doing better. In fact, he had uh, most of a day that he had, the numbers were dropping, he was feeling better and everything, and then everything turned around and it went really dreadfully bad real quick. And by that end of the day, Linda said that 
Larry was slipping away. And uh, hard things to hear. But everybody rallied and prayed, and God listened and got to work. They determined that the stint was made out of metal and it was irritating the, that gland, and so uh, they decided to go back in. And it was uh, the third time because the first was for a biopsy and the second was uh, to put in the stent. Now they had to remove it and put in another one. And while they were in there, they found something that turned out to be the cause of the whole problem. His gallbladder had uh, ceased working and was dead completely. And so they put the stent in and scheduled a surgery for the gallbladder and went back in again and uh, replaced that. Linda said that um, Larry is doing much better. And uh, along with this, he got a terrible uh, infection. Uh, I think it was MRSA or something like that. Or anyway, it was um, something I was worried he wouldn't make it through the night. And, uh, but God answered our prayers and he's doing much better and looks like he may be on the road to recovery. So those of you knew, who knew about this issue and prayed, I want to thank you for that um, as the family would thank you also. Um, but mostly, I want to express gratitude this morning to God that loves us so much as individuals, each one of us, and is there at our high points and at our lowest points with his wisdom and love guiding us through life and restoring us according to the goodness of his heart when he sees that that's best for us. So I just praise the Lord today as each one of you do. Don't we have a great God? <laughs> Fantastic God. I'm just totally amazed all the time I got, a, I got a call from an old friend also. You know, Larry and I have been friends since the beginning of my ministry in South Carolina. He was our youth director, and I was the, the pastor in the church where we were building the youth camp. So it goes way, way back. But in that same church, that same little church that I got a chance to preach in this summer, um, my church treasurer had a son living in California. And when I got a call to come to California and pastor in the Arlington Church, um, I got to meet that son I never knew about. She was always talking about. And um, we've been friends for a long time, too. Every once in a while, he gives me a call and says, you got to see this, you got to see that. And um, I've kind of gotten to know him well enough through the years that when he's calling me about something, he's kind of uh, concerned. Um, concerned that it may trigger the thing and the Lord will come back. That is something we all look forward to. But also looking forward to it, some of us have a twinge of concern that maybe we're not ready yet. <laughs> maybe we ought to get ourselves together. or we ought to do this or we ought to do that. And so Ken called me with his latest one, and that was a concern about a preacher that, a rabbi actually, Messianic Jewish rabbi, he had heard a presentation on. His name is Rabbi Khan, and he had, his presentation was dealing with the Jubilees and the seven-year periods, uh, and, and that uh, the United States has had two warnings, and we're coming up to another, 9-11 being one of them, we're coming up to another Jubilee, and, um, and what is God going to punish the United States for this time? Now, I'm not going to speak to the correctness or rightness of what Rabbi um, Khan has stated. It certainly gives us uh, food to ponder. But what I'm concerned about is in our church family and beyond, within the Adventist church, within the community, of Christians and believers in Jesus Christ, how do we relate to the soon coming of Jesus Christ? How do we feel about ourselves in that endeavor? 
And how do we feel about God? Is it an experience that we long for from the depth of our heart and can't wait to get off the face of this earth? Or is it one that we feel we need a little more time with? God has a little more to do to us. There's more that we need to perfect in our lives, if you would say. The real question, I come to my conclusion that many of us ask ourselves about at times of, of brief times of doubt, and, and that is the question, what is God really wanting for us? I first thought it was what God wants out of us, and some of us might think of it that way too. But as I've studied the Scripture, I've come to the conclusion that God brings before us questions sometimes that has more to do with what is God wanting to accomplish in us. What does God hope to accomplish in us? Is our response to God one of concern or one of great joy in the anticipation of His return? I believe that God desires us not to somehow effectively create within us a savability. I believe that what He wants to do with us is to create within us an experience of longing to be with Him because we truly know Him. Is it that we grow in our understandings and appreciation of God and by that growth are drawn closer to Him and a desire to respond to Him is planted by Him within our hearts, within ourselves? And does that flower and become something in our life? I heard uh, actually a presentation in this church one time in Sabbath school where the conclusion of end times was our response should study, study, study. I at the time thought that that was completely off base. I thought for the last times we need to learn to trust, trust, trust. (laughs) And I think there is something to that but the more I've thought about it and what I would like to share with you today there is a place in these times so close to Christ's return for us to desire to understand God much better and much deeper than we do today. No one's to be faulted for not having gotten as deep as they would like to. The reality of our culture today is one in which we find ourselves overwhelmed and on overload with all the different things that need to be accomplished or done for survival, for our family, for all the things that the culture calls us to obtain in life. It doesn't leave a whole lot of time for thinking and pondering, studying, and listening. It's the challenge that we have today. I appreciate so much the scripture reading on John 12, 44 through 50. And by the way, um, my whole presentation is centered on three books of the Bible today. John, basically chapters 10 through 17. When you go home, you might be able to find much of um, of the good things in there. Um, Matthew uh, chapter 25 as Pastor Hona shared with us last week is a key and also in the Old Testament Psalms chapter 119 in this particular verse that was read today is verse 47 and it's one that's jumped out to me when I wonder about what is my relationship to the last days and where will I fit in this schemes when God steps on this earth will I find myself a sheep (laughs) or will I find myself a goat it's interesting in verse 47 to note 
in it he says and if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them I expected him to follow that up with something different than he did here's the follow up I do not judge him isn't that interesting if you heard it all if you got the whole the whole lot and you're listening to God and everything but you didn't quite get it God says through Jesus Jesus says it's not me who judges you I do not judge you but I have come to save the world I've come to save you so our relationship with Jesus and with God is not one as an adversarial experience it's one where he's doing everything on his part for our salvation he is fixed on getting us home again he wants us back home that's what it's all about it's interesting later on the verse it finds out that actually you judge yourself <laughs> you contribute and create your own judgment on your own very interesting concept the I'd like to now uh, share with you Matthew 25 26 Greg shared something that really I keyed off of and really gave me a new understanding as to what God might be looking for us in that it's the talent of it's the um, the parable about the talents ten talents divvied up one gets only one um, that person goes and he figures out that if he loses this talent he's going to be in big trouble because his understanding about God and his master actually his master is his master is a harsh guy and he expects a lot out of it and if he doesn't do it right he's going to be in big trouble so he goes out and does the safest thing he can do in olden times he finds a place that no one would ever plow up or look and he digs a hole and he buries it when he comes back the master does he pulls it up and takes the talent to him he says I know you're a harsh taskmaster <laughs> explains the whole thing the interesting thing in that is when you look down a little further we realize that the master was saying if you knew I was this way if that's your perception of me you should have done this the interesting thing as I read that I begin to understand that the master is saying you didn't ever understand me you worked off the premise that as I, I was a harsh taskmaster if you had understood me that way you should have done such and such I have the reality is that one with one talent had said look I want to do the best for him I possibly can I'm gonna risk it all <laughs> and he had lost it that master would have said you tried and that's good the problem was he didn't know his master didn't know the master read him wrong went the wrong direction until we really know God and trust him at his word we'll always worry about our salvation we'll always be concerned because we don't really know the God that has offered it when you do know him you know that he has accomplished it for you and his big thrust is to get you home and the only thing in the way is your decision making along the way if you know him you know you're okay everyone who has much that parable will get more and in abundance if this parable was partially about the fact that the individual did not know his master then the reality is if you really try to get to know him it multiplies and it gets deeper and bigger and more beautiful those of you that are on this journey with God and you're getting to know him and you're studying and you're praying and you're understanding him and spending time with him the more you understand the more you see the more exciting it gets doesn't it 
because it's being multiplied in abundance within you. But the person who doesn't take advantage of that relationship, that opportunity to really know God, we're told, what will happen will be, if he had a little bit, he'll lose it all. Lose it all. Everyone who has much will get more and in abundance. Those who have very little will lose what they have. It's a relationship and understanding that God wants to get deeper and deeper. Now, the interesting thing is that he says that there is actually in John 14, 20 and around that verse, you, you find the whole thing where he says, God is within me and I'm within God. And then if I am within you, God is within you and I in you. And it goes in that verse that you, it explains that in that day you shall know that I'm in my Father and you in me. The reality is that if we desire to know God, if we desire to know Jesus our Savior, that will perfect in abundance to the place that God dwells within. And when you walk down the street and an opportunity comes, God talks through you. And when you get up in the morning and you feel a little grouchy, God talks to you. And when you have an opportunity to be a peacemaker, God talks through you. He's there. He's within you. He's there with you. Everyone who has much will get more. And in that day, you will be in my Father, and you will be in me, and I will be in you. John 10, 14 is the parable of the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Isn't that fantastic? God really wants to know us, and I think he knows us more intimately than we can imagine it. And he wants us to know him in the same sphere, to have that intimate understanding of this indwelling God that just really wants to get us back home again. This is what God wants to do. He judges not. He wants to have you understand him deeply and he wants to grow that understanding deeply within your heart. The Old Testament reading is found in your Pew Bible 571. It's Psalm 119, 165 to 168. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, and I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. Peace. When I was a little boy, I thought peace meant no more war. I have a feeling that when God said he wanted us to have his peace. He meant a little more than just no war. In my teen years growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist, I had no peace whatsoever. It came to a point in my life where I felt that I couldn't be good enough for God no matter how hard I tried. I sat through four years of high school weeks of prayers and all the calls and I made lots of decisions but they always went south on me somehow within two or three days I didn't know how to be an Adventist with peace in 
John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to Lazarus' sister, Martha, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me shall live even as he died. And in John 14, 27, he said, My peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give to you. You would think as a young boy with an understanding that Jesus is able to raise the dead and they can live again and that he's calling me to be a part of that flock that I would understand peace. I can remember clearly one saying to me in a Bible class, well, you will know when you're saved When Jesus comes again and you look at him, if it's too bright, (laughs) you better call for the right, the rocks and the mountains to fall upon you. And when it, uh, when, when, when you look and you can absorb the brightness and not run from it, then you're saved. That's when you'll find out. Well, I find that peaceless and not what God has wanted us to experience. You see the God that loves you so much that can't wait to give you back, get you back into that heavenly kingdom with him for all eternity and has thrown everything in God's power and that's a lot to accomplish that for you and for him because he loves you so deeply he wants you back. If that God loves you so much, I believe that if he has done all that and told you in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And over and over and over tell you those things in scripture, then When he says, I want to leave with you my peace, that that peace is grounded in a reality that comes from him also. We can only experience peace as we grow in Jesus Christ closer and closer to him and understand that that salvation is so big and so full and so done for us that we can face the problems in this life knowing that God has made a place for us in that holy city. Then we live in peace in a world that knows no peace. And then we accomplish one more thing. He says that he wishes that in John 13, 34, that we would accept a new commandment that he gave us, that you would love one another even as he has loved you, that you also love one another. Two times he said it. You see, if we understand that God has really done it for us, and it so makes us fall in love, it's much like a human experience with, and I think he created marriage for this very reason, so that he could under, we could understand that you could fall in love to such depth with him that you would want to respond and do things because you want to do it not because you have to, that you find yourself so loved by somebody that you want to return that love. And then he says, once I create that experience in you and we're having this kind of wonderful deep relationship, then I want you to live in peace so that others will see your peace within you. And they'll go, my, I wish I had that. How do I get that? How can you live during these times and not want to dig a big hole and fill it up after you? How do you have that peace? Because you were not created 
to be loved by God alone. God is a multitudinous lover. <laughs> and He wants to love people through you. He lives in you. He loves through you. That's what our God is all about. How do I accomplish that? How do I accomplish that? There's a song that I've sang for years and I've never quite digested completely all the depths of the beauty that is in this song. It's entitled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's not that hard. Fix your gaze on Jesus. Find out more about Him. Get to know Him. Make Him the one you're looking at. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Really see it for what it is. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Let's stand together and sing that to Him. to the first verse. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a and the Savior and life Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, as we walk out of this experience with you today, walk with us. Don't leave our side. Stay within us. Focus our eyes upon you. Teach us more and more about who you are. Fill us with your presence and use us to touch other lives. We'll see you in the heavenly kingdom. Amen.